I'm Alan Tannenbaum of Tannenbaum, Scroll of Mole and Kleinberg. I have my partners with us today, uh, Salvador Scro and John LaMole and our associate, Brian Tannenbaum. And we also have uh, our paralegals, Megan Skillman and Courtney Callahan, because I thought it'd be really good for them to learn what we do on a daily basis out there in the field when we visit condo uh, condo buildings and townhome, townhome type structures. So they're joining us. And of course, uh, Michelle Colburn, who sets up these panels for us and runs our technology, who's our business development director, and she's, she's on with us. And we have as a special guest today, uh, one of the engineers that we utilize uh, on our cases for uh, forensic, forensic engineering, testifying and so forth, uh, Felix Martin and uh, Sal Scro and Felix Martin are gonna lead the show. Uh, uh, John, Brian and I are gonna interject questions uh, at times and we'll repeat some of your questions as they go along. It's gonna be very interactive in the sense that there's gonna be um, a number of photos put up and explanations and so forth. So you should, should enjoy that. Uh, the, uh, but I wanna, I wanna in, uh, send your questions for your mute. For managers, this is not a CEU course. So don't get disappointed with that, but you're gonna learn a lot. But I'll, 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 before I turn it over to Sal, I'm gonna tell my lawyer engineer accountant joke. It's very quick. So the question that's posed to a lawyer and engineer and accountant, what's two plus one? So Felix Martin answers on behalf of the engineers and he's furiously working at his computer for a half hour. He's sweating. He says, well, by my best calculation with a coefficient of 4.26, I believe it's approximately three. And then the accountant sitting there says, well, what do you want it to be? And the lawyer says, I'm not quite sure, but it's gonna be a little more than I first thought. So anyway, that's my lawyer joke, lawyer accountant engineering joke for the day. So with that said, I'm gonna turn the program over to uh, my partner, Sal Scro. Morning, everyone. Um, you've heard us talk a lot in all these seminars, and if any of you have been to our uh, to our CEU courses, you've heard us talk a lot about uh, the importance of inspecting your building, the, the importance of finding the right person to inspect your building. And I've stressed quite often that, in my opinion, uh, if you have roof problems or stucco problems, you don't call the roofer the stucco. In most situations, you should call an engineer. Uh, today we have Felix Martin with us who is uh, an engineer that we've worked with substantially in, uh, in investigation of buildings. Uh, so rather than hear us talk about it, today you're going to get a chance to see some of the things we do. I'm going to share a screen with you uh, and you should all be seeing the uh, what lies beneath screen and uh, just make sure I have this okay. All right, so let's make sure, oh, you know what? I wanna go back here, one thing. Let me stop sharing this for a minute and it's working, okay, we're good. All right, so what lies beneath uh, the, the importance of looking below the surface and detecting building problems? So uh, this is what we do. We find the problems that, that you don't see. Um, and with that, I have uh, some information on some of the areas that we've looked at in destructive testing, but we have Felix Martin. Uh, he's a structural engineer with Marcon Forensics. Uh, this is uh, generally what they do. Uh, Felix, if you wanna interject, I'll let you give a quick introduction of yourself before we get into the meat of things. Sure. Um, thanks, Sal. So as, as Sal mentioned, my name is Felix Martin. I am an engineer. Um, I've been doing forensics work, strictly nothing but forensics work since 1996. 
I've been involved in investigations across the United States, in Florida, in Nevada, in California, in Colorado, in Arizona, in Utah, and in Oregon. Um, I've worked with the Tannenbaum firm for um, a number of years, probably now, probably like 10 or 12 years by now. Uh, and I have to say that as far as one of the construction defect law firms out there, uh, they have certainly been one of the better firms to work for, uh, as they have a lot of experience in this type of uh, situation. They understand what the problems are, and they understand how to address them and how to uh, essentially recover for, uh, for the homeowners. Um, but with regards to my own work, um, uh, my firm became a forensic firm in 1996. And since then, that's been our focus. We accept no work from developers um, because we want to avoid any conflict of interest. And the work that we do is largely re representing homeowner associations so that we can determine when there is a problem, what the problem is, and what the extent of the damage is, and, and ultimately how to repair that damage. Back to you, Sal. Okay. <clears throat> So uh, what we're going to do is show you some things and we may, depending on the time, we may skip through a little bit, but for example, here's one of the first projects I worked with Felix Martin on. Uh, Felix, when we first went into this project, uh, we went out and we did a walkthrough of the project. Tell me what you were looking for, just walking through, looking at these buildings uh, when we went out there. Well, this is, uh, this is a, this is a very, good projects to, uh, to start out with. This is a project that we worked on quite a while back, about 10 years ago. Um, it's a project that, you know, again, it didn't really, to the untrained eye, did not really seem to have a lot of issues. There was some stucco cracking, certainly, uh, but nothing to the extent that we later found out uh, was evident. So it's the kind of thing that I think uh, someone without the background and knowledge that we have, that Sal and I have, uh, would really not be able to notice right off the bat. But as we walked the project, we could definitely see telltale signs that there are issues. And, and some of those telltale signs are in the form of the stucco crack. Now, people will say, you know, stucco cracks, of course, but the question is what sort of cracks are there? Where are they occurring? What is the nature of the cracking that we see? What are the conditions that we see that have been historically problematic? Because we have the background, we're able to take a look at areas that we know historically have had problems with water intrusion and damage. And we can focus on those as, as we do our visual inspection. And, and Sal, because like I said, he's done a lot of this work. He's really good at doing this type of um, investigation as well. He can take a look at a property and already from his background and experience be able to tell what doesn't seem like a lot of damage could actually be problematic. So as you look at this photograph right here, you don't see a lot of evidence of damage. It doesn't really seem like this is a problematic project. And yet, as we walk through it, we could see that there was a lot of evidence that was visually available to us to tell us that this was going to be a project that was going to be essentially in, in deep trouble, even though it didn't look that way. So the types of things that we look for are areas, like I said, that we have known previously to be historically problematic. Uh, and typically these intersections between the roof and the stucco um, have been a problem in the past. You have a very good code in, in Florida. The Florida Building Code is, is a very good document, but there are areas that it doesn't really necessarily address very specifically. And that, that is the intersection of different installations, such as the intersection of the roof with the stucco. And those are installations that are done by two separate subcontractors. You have the roofing contractor and you have the stucco subcontractor. And pretty much a lot of the times they're focused on their own work. And they don't necessarily focus on the interaction between the work that they do. So when we get to these areas where the two intersect, where you have problems with the flashing at these roof to wall intersections, those are typically areas that have been problematic in the past. And, and this, it, in this project, that, that was exactly the case. Um, as we took a look at it, we could see that the installations that existed, even though, again, to the untrained eye, as you see this photograph, doesn't seem to be a problem. Doesn't seem like there's a problem there. 
The fact is we know that these installations are problematic and that water is getting in and causing damage. So once again, you, you look at these elevations that, that uh, Sal is showing you here, and you don't really see much that you as an untrained person could see that was an issue that would say, okay, this is speaking to me that, that I'm in big trouble here. Um, but when Sal brought me out to this project, he already knew that this was a problematic installation because he has, like I said, he's been to these types of projects before and he's learned to recognize the issues or the locations where potential problems occur. So by the time he brought me out, essentially he already had a pretty good idea that this project was going to be something where the construction had been deficient and where that deficiency in the construction was going to allow water to penetrate and cause damage. I, ha I have to say it is important. Uh, the managers of the associations, they play a big role uh, in, in assisting our uh, attempts to recover for the construction defects and assisting the, uh, the engineer in doing the proper investigation. So I know on this project we had uh, great assistance. So for the managers, don't discount your role in, in helping the association in, in addressing these issues. Sal, do you, Sal, what was the, as we're looking at these pictures, what was the, uh, the age of, of these buildings at this point? This was, a, this was a, uh, an apartment complex built in 2004. When we first got out there, it was maybe 2000. Uh, it was converted a few years after. And we got out there and I think we did initial uh, look at the place in 2011 and in 2012, uh, I think was when we did the investigation of, of the project. So one of the things too here is, you know, you're looking at this and walking through and, and we knew that there were some complaints of window leaks and stucco cracking, but with Felix out there walking through the, the areas that we pointed out in the prior slides, those were things and he, he identified, this isn't necessarily a stucco problem. There were stucco problems, but one of the major concerns and you'll see is how uh, some of those little pieces that we walk by every day and don't even pay attention to make a big difference in the interior of the building. And if you don't address them in a timely fashion, you're gonna run into a lot of trouble. So uh, what's this, Felix? Now, before, you get, before you get there, uh, there's a question how do we know when to have an inspection if we don't see problems with an untrained eye? Well, that's, that's a really good question because again, that, that's what it takes. Um, most of the time, what happens is that you may get a couple of leaks from the roof and you may think, well, you know, that's, that's kind of a, a, a situation to be expected. But I guess the first answer would be don't minimize when you have some water intrusion because the problem is that even a small amount of water coming in can cause a, a horrific amount of damage. So the first indication would be if you're having any kind of a problem at all, you should definitely be contacting someone to come out and make sure that what, what's happening is either not a problem or, or something that needs to be addressed right away. And that should be stress. It needs to be addressed right away if it is a problem, because even a small amount of water uh, within a contained space is, is going to cause a lot of damage. Because the problem is that most of the damage that will occur will occur under the building finishes. And so when it comes time to repair, you have to remove the finish. And that makes the repair a very expensive proposition. So the rather other, than stick your hand in the sand, what you have to do is you have to be proactive about this. And if you have any kind of indication that water is coming through, you should definitely get someone out. But in addition to that, I think that if you have a project that is approaching um, you know, a, a certain age, you should definitely have someone uh, take a look at it. And the best people to contact, of course, would be the law firm, because they will be able to tell you, first of all, if there is a chance for recovery, should there be an issue, but also they have the resources, like someone like myself, to come out and call and say, hey, Felix, can you go out and take a look at this? Um, and, and we can do that. But what we would recommend, and what your general counsel probably would recommend, is that all buildings, whether you think they're problematic or not, should be inspected on some periodic basis uh, by an engineer. Uh, uh, a lot of times the insurance companies require that anyway. So that would be the answer. If nothing's obvious, have an engineer out there to make sure that 
uh, what you're saying is is what what is affect the situation. So, Sal, go ahead. All right. So, Felix, um, I'm going to lead you into this a little bit. Why is it that there's a uh, that this was an, a location that you decided to investigate? Yeah, so this is a location that we decided to investigate because it offers a lot of a lot of good information if, when we're doing our investigation. So what you're looking at is is the front of the building, and you're looking at an intersection of the the lower roof. First of all, or I should say the lower roof. There, um, there is a an intersection between the roof and the stucco, and then at the same time, it's the lower corner of a window. So by by essentially cutting the stucco out in this one area we're getting information with regards to the window installation, the flashing around the window, the installation of the stucco, the installation of the building wrap, the installation of the roof, and the installation of the flashing between the roof and the, and the wall. So just this, this one location, there are a number of components that historically have been problematic, and yet with a single cut, we can remove the stucco at that location and get a lot of information as to how that was put together. How did the contractors install the stucco? How did they install the windows? How did they install the roofs? How did they install the flashing? So we select these test locations so that we get the maximum amount of information and we minimize the impact on the community. So we don't wanna be just cutting holes everywhere. We cut a good size hole, but we, we select locations that are going to provide the maximum amount of information as far as all the different trades that were involved in the project. So how do you select, if you have multiple buildings or even a single building, how do you select the areas that you want to test? Do you just look for the bad areas? No, 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 we don't. Uh, and, and there's good reasons for that. Um, the first thing is that when we select the areas to test, we try to get a spread across the site. So we don't focus on just the older buildings. We don't focus on the newer buildings. We try to pick locations that are spread out across the site so that we get a good sampling of data. But to find, to find, to, to say that the problems are going to occur only where you can see obvious signs of damage is not what we do. Because what we have determined from history has been that even areas that look perfectly good, once you open them up and you test them, you will find that there are going to be massive amounts of damage behind it. So just because it looks good is not an indication that there isn't water intrusion taking place and damage taking place. So these locations are selected not so much by the way they look as by getting the information across the site. Construction, when it comes to production housing, is repetitive. It's like a car factory. You have people that do the same task over and over and over again. So typically, if we find a problem in, in one corner of a project, we're going to find that same problem across the site because the installer that's doing that installation improperly is going to repeat that mistake all the way across the site. So, so we have a question here. Uh, do you participate in the turnover from the developer? And I don't know if the question is to the engineer or to, to the attorney, but I will tell you from the attorney standpoint, uh, yes, we think it is important that uh, you have an attorney participate in the turnover from the developer for several reasons. Uh, one is there's a, if it's a condominium, there's a, a extensive list of items that need to be turned over at, at turnover. Uh, some of those things include a, an inspection report by a, an engineer, and there's certain things that have to be in that report. So many times we'll see uh, those reports are either left out or if they are turned over, they are not, they are not given uh, with the information required by statute. Uh, it's also important to get a list of the contractors and subcontractors and the work they performed. So you know if you have problems, uh, not only the general contractor and developer, but what subcontractors you should go to to address these issues. Um, and Alan, uh, you know, one of the things we talk about sometimes is we hear from the owners is that uh, they have warranties, but and 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 they have a one-year warranty, and they should come out and fix these things. How does that? Uh, what's the response to that with regard to that? There's other avenues regarding whether it's a condominium, if there's a uh, statutory warranty or HOA. Uh, other, how, what other 
means can can owners and associations address any construction defect problems? Well, uh, then that may be for a whole nother session, Sal. The, the, here's a key. Um, a quick version. Here, here's a key. Our, our firm takes HOAs and condo associations through turnover. We, we help you get the engineering. We help you get the evaluations. Uh, and, and then we handle the claim. So that is, that is basically what our firm does. And, and we bring in engineers like Felix upon turnover and, and engineers who do site evaluations for HOAs. We bring them in uh, to do the analysis. We help with the scope of the analysis and so forth. So that's what, that's what we're here for. But Sal, I wanna see the rest of the guts in this building. So get to it. All right, here we go. So here we are at another position here uh, at a chimney. And this was another area selected because as Felix pointed out, he found the area of the, uh, uh, of the uh, roof to wall intersection with some flashing that was an issue. So I'm gonna skip through some of these. And uh, why don't you explain uh, the process here, Felix, and I'll sl slip through some of these as you speak. So again, as, as you saw initially, you know, that before we actually started testing that, the, the stucco did not really appear to be heavily damaged, but we saw the connection and the way that the flashing appeared to have been done between the roof and the stucco. And we could see that historically this has been a problem. And so we selected this as one of the areas that we wanted to test. And, and sure enough, as you see here, as we started removing the stucco, we found that water had penetrated from the roof into the wall. And then that, uh, that, that had started causing the, the type of damage that you see here. Now, what you're looking at there is as, as we're chasing the, uh, the water damage down, you can see the amount of rot that has taken place to, to the point where the framing is actually being, the structural framing is being damaged by this water intrusion. Even though there was really no visual evidence on the exterior before we started testing that this was taking place. So this is an example of where a small amount of water, when it starts to penetrate over a long period of time, is going to cause an extensive amount of damage. Keep in mind, this is starting up at the high roof, water flows downhill. And so as that water is coming in, that damage actually extended all the way from the roof to the bottom of the wall, which meant that the repair for that conditioning essentially required that all of that framing had to be taken out and completely replaced. So even a small amount coming in at the roof to the chimney intersection produced enough damage where you now have to take all the stucco off and take all the framing out and repair it or replace it, uh, which again gets gets kind of uh, kind of uh, kind of expensive. Right, everybody's still hearing us, I hope. Yes. Yeah, I'm having some issues here too. Can you still hear me? Yes, I can. Okay. Everybody else out there, give, give a wave, yes? We're still good? Okay, go ahead, because we got a strange message. Yeah, it just, it just came back. We're good now. Okay. Hey, Felix, are you there, Felix? Yeah, I'm here. So once again, right. this is damage continuing down from that water intrusion that we saw at the top. Now, as this water is penetrating, it continues to cause this damage. And so, like I said, you, you can literally follow the damage all the way down to the ground uh, where it started up at the top right there at that photograph uh, where we could see the flashing was not done properly. Uh, and then as soon as we opened it up, we saw that confirmation that yes, the flashing had not prevented the water from getting in. And uh, you can see that the damage above that location has no damage. So it, it confirmed that the water was getting in at that intersection between the roof the wall and the wall, just as we thought it had, uh, it had uh, started. The, uh, Sal, there's a question about uh, townhome communities, and hopefully uh, you folks can still hear us. So there's a question about townhome communities, and do the same type of issues apply? And the answer is yes. Uh, most of them are built under an HOA regime and not a condominium regime. You don't have statutory warranties as a result but you do have uh, recovery for building code violations. 
uh, for, for negligent uh, uh, construction. And uh, some of actually our larger cases have been HOA townhome communities. So it definitely applies. As far as there's a question about HOAs, um, you, you may not have building, it may be a single family home community, but the same process exists. You get the entire infrastructure inspected. You look at the accounting and the, and the budgeting from the, the developer also. Uh, you get engineers out to do those evaluations. Uh, and then we handle negotiations with the developer uh, to, to make things right after the fact. So that is definitely a part of our practice. There's a question about uh, it repairs to existing buildings. We're not going to cover that in this session, but really the same forensic analysis applies. If you have a, a roof that's leaking on an older building, you had better get a good engineering inspection done of that roof, which may include some invasive testing. Otherwise, you really don't know what the recipe for solution is because you really haven't gotten to the, uh, to the root of the problem. So the same forensic process applies even in those circumstances. Yeah, go ahead, Sal. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna add to that. I'm gonna go back on that for a second, but, but the construction, the, the state of construction in the state of Florida is, is just horrendous. That, that's that's the, the best word that I can describe it. I mean, like I said, I, I've done work in Nevada and Arizona, which are dry states where it hardly ever rains. And, and the conditions for waterproofing buildings in, in Nevada and Arizona are much, much better than what they are in the state of Florida. I've mentioned that there are good codes in effect in Florida, but the fact is that builders just choose not to follow them. So there are rules in place and, and they just do not follow those rules. That's one of the reasons why you have to be always cognizant of bringing someone in like, like Sal and Alan, who are attorneys, that know the rules and know what to do about making sure that those rules uh, are followed or should have been followed or what to do about them. So Alan just mentioned, you know, the whole issue between condominiums and townhomes. The construction is just as bad for construction in, in townhomes as it is in condominiums, but some of the rules are slightly different. In condominiums, you're required to provide a turnover report. Well, that's, that's a, <clears throat> a turnover report is a, is a well-intentioned document uh, that, that's prescribed by law, but who pays for that turnover document? The builder does. So the, the builder essentially pays an engineer to go out an inspection and say that the developer's work is deficient or not. Well, if that engineer ever expects to get work back from that developer, what's, what, what are they going to do? They're, they're going to have these very, very basic reports that, that essentially don't want to see anything that's wrong. And so turnover reports reports tend to be a source of a lot of misinformation in that they don't really go deep enough into analyzing what was done wrong. We've seen turnover reports that were done by a guy essentially driving through the community uh, inside his car and taking photographs from the car without ever getting out of the car. And so Felix, to, to, really, Felix, to cl Felix, to clarify that, uh, actually the report is, is, is for a different intent. It's more like a reserve study than it is a defect report. And in fact, uh, the engineers who do them, many of them put a, and right in the first paragraph of the report, make it very clear that it's not a defect report. So um, a, a lot of groups get confused that they get this turnover report to say, well, why do we need our own engineer? And the reality is, is, is everything that Felix said, but also the purpose of the report is much different. It is not a a report to report on defects. It's more in the line of a reserve report. All right, um, Sal, you had a good photograph up there a second ago. Did we lose Sal? Did we get rid of Sal? All right, Felix, while we're Sal is here. Muted. Sal, unmute. What? Sal got muted. Michelle, did you mute poor Sal? I can. How about now? Yeah, there you are. But we lost your screen here. All right. I got to see what happened with all this. Hold on. This something's going on with our internet today. While Sal's doing that, Alan, I think another good point and uh, that Felix raised is that um, there's a lot of non-compliance with codes, and people might say, "Well, it gets approved by the county or the build, you know, the city building official." 
So what does that mean? Um, and that's, you know, brings up a good point about approval by the municipality doesn't necessarily mean that you're out, you're out of a claim uh, because you can still bring a statutory claim for violating a building code if the contractor knew or should have known, regardless of whether there was approval. Uh, John, the, the, John, John, the simple answer is every defective building in Florida that's occupied has a certificate of occupancy. Right. Exactly. So, and I, Felix will tell you there's a lot of occupied buildings with defects. So, uh, it, it, the building approval at the outset really is not a defense to anybody. Right. And okay, the Supreme so Court, we, Supreme Court of Florida has said that. Go ahead, Sal. We were showing uh, the entranceway here, and I think we're pointing over to this area here, and inside, we found some just a little bit of water just a little bit but uh uh you know this was an area that um you know felix actually he found this in his walkthrough and i i have to tell you uh and i say this during our during our seminars about the right expert and the key is to get an expert who can communicate somebody who knows what they're talking about and is interesting and I've sat through depositions and, and Felix is, uh, is one of the best as far as when it comes to explaining to the, the general public what the issues are and, and how they found them. But um, I'm gonna just flip through some of these because we have quite a few slides. Uh, this, area, this area here, Felix, uh, explain what this, this piece is right here because that's right, so something of importance, I think. Right, that, this is what's called a roof diverter. And, and the idea is as you have water flowing down the roof, meeting the water flowing down the wall, uh, it serves to collect that water and it's called a diverter because it's bent that way so that the water gets kicked out away from the, uh, from the face of the building. Uh, unfortunately, this type of diverter that you see here is, is uh, famous for, or infamous I should say, for, uh, for not really what being watertight. And, and the problem with that, of course, is that it allows water to penetrate. And you can see that in, in this photograph, the damage that's starting to cause behind it. Uh, it has water penetrating through a number of areas. Uh, it, I think earlier you saw a photograph of the backside of the diverter, uh, which was not sealed. Water got in through that. It also has water that comes in through the front side of the diverter because the construction of the diverter is such that it leaks into the building. So there are wa there's water coming in from the work that was done by the roofer in terms of not providing a diverter uh, that, that doesn't leak. There's water coming in as a result of the work of the stucco installer in that the stucco was improperly installed and allows that moisture to get in. And there's water coming in as a result of the work of the painter because the painter didn't provide the sealant behind the diverter to keep that water from coming in. So you have I a remember one of people at that one point. I remember one time being in Jacksonville and talking to Felix on the phone and having him explain this to me and having me fold a piece of paper because some of these diverters are fabricated. So my advice to anybody that's having uh, any re-roofing issues out there, if you're going to have a contractor out there, please, you know, have your contracts reviewed in advance. But one of the things you should also ask is maybe a review by uh, a professional like Felix to, to review the contracts. Because one of the things I would say to specify is that you have a uh, you have a manufactured diverter uh, as required in the project because what they do is they fabricate these out of L flashing on the on the site and what happens is there's problems so it's very important the minor details if you require certain things uh, they will be out there. Here's an example of, of, a, uh, of a location where they actually didn't even bother to build a diverter. So you don't, you don't have that piece that essentially kicks the water out away from the wall. So once again, as water is coming down that, uh, that roof, it gets to that termination and, and it goes actually inside the stucco. It's, it's essentially being directed to go into this or behind the stucco and into the wall cavity, which of course is, is never a good thing. Um, if you have the diverter, at least you have something that's going to try to divert some moisture out where, where you have it completely missing, then it's just essentially pouring that water into a wall cavity and that's just gonna be nothing but, uh, but trouble. So you can see that, that the damage isn't occurring just to the, to the wood framing, it's occurring to the stucco as well. 
the backside of the stucco that you saw there a second ago had a lot of rusted lath. And that rusted lath eventually expands to the point where it will begin to cause damage to the stucco. And then that brings in additional water to cause additional damage. Felix, what, what is lath? Lath is essentially the reinforcing that uh, that's placed inside the stucco. It's like rebar and concrete, except in this case, it's stucco plaster. And so the lath is, is what, you know, you, we used to call it the chicken wire um, that you put in there to reinforce the stucco so that as it expands and contracts, it controls the amount of cracking that you can have in it. But the other thing that it does is, is the means by which the lath, or sorry, the stucco is applied to the building, attached to the building because the lath is stapled into the building. So if your lath becomes damaged, first of all, you have no reinforcing. And so the stucco will become damaged. But the other thing that happens is the lath will lose whatever anchorage it has to the building to the point where it actually starts literally coming off the building and, and falling to the ground. So the uh, when it's concrete, when it's stucco on a concrete block, do you typically have lath or is it just where it's a wood frame structure? No, you, you typically find lath when you have construction over wood frame. Um, there is some construction over masonry where you can have lath, but typically you don't. Uh, when you apply stucco on, on directly on masonry, what happens is there's an actual uh, chemical and uh, mechanical bond that occurs between the stucco and the masonry block so that when it finally cures, it's actually like a single unit. And, and you wanna see that, that bond occur. Now, when uh, a lot of the townhome buildings that we've seen are built first floor block, second floor wood frame, so you have a different type of stucco application, what, what kind of issues does that cause? Well, you have the same wood issues, of course, but when it comes to the block, what you have is you that you have water penetration, and that water penetration typically occurs around the windows, and then when that water comes in, what it does is it starts to delaminate the stucco from the, from the masonry. And so eventually that stucco starts to pull away from the wall and again, literally begins to fall off the building. The other thing that it does is because that water is coming in around the windows is it produces damage to the interior. People forget that even when you have a block wall, the interior of the building is furred out with wood framing and it has drywall, which has paper in it. And so when that moisture get, gets in, it has an opportunity to produce mold behind the wall and that mold can be, of course, not a not a good thing to have around. All right, Sal, so, uh, we got we got about twenty minutes, so yeah. You, so I want to flip through just a I, couple. I won't interrupt again. Yeah, I want to get through a couple of these, Felix. I'm going to run through these kind of quickly, but here's an area that you looked at and looks okay. But we're just going to flip through, and I'll let you talk as we go through this. <clears throat> yeah, once again, this is an area where we were getting water intrusion around the windows, and that water, of course, was flowing down. As it flows down, you can see where that is. Uh, it's retained at the bottom of that wall. And it's just, you know, once it gets to that point where it's wet, and you can see that doesn't look bad. But when you take it apart, you see that it's produced not just damage to the wall sheathing, but to the framing as well. And so after a while, you start wondering, well, what the heck is actually holding up this wall? Because the damage to the structural components has been so extensive that is literally in danger of collapse. So um, those, again, even a small amount of water, a small amount of water, but every single rainstorm, you multiply that by the number of rainstorms that occur in Florida within a year, it builds up. And when that moisture level reaches a certain threshold, the microorganisms that multiply and produce the rot uh, just start multiplying like crazy. And they just start chewing up on the cellulose. And that's what produces the rot damage that you see. This is a condition that we see under the windows where the installation of the stucco is done improperly and the waterproofing paper is installed in such a way that instead of keeping water out and away from the wood, it actually guides water into the wood. And, and as you can see there, it, it produces damage. One of the problems that we have, of course, is we have wood construction in Florida. There's nothing wrong with wood construction. You just have to make sure that you protect it properly. But you have a wet climate like Florida where it's always going to be raining. And the danger is you have to make sure that you protect against that water intrusion. And that's just not being done by builders. You can see in this, Explain case, there's water right. coming in at the window. Um, that's what you're looking at. And, and you see the damage directly underneath the window because that water has come in around the window and through the window. And you can see the amount of damage that it's producing. Now, once again, you multiply that water intrusion 
by the number of rainstorms within a year in Florida, by a few years, it's no wonder that you get this type of damage because that damage just continues to happen and it just, uh, it multiplies. Because as soon explain as that- Explain what this is. What, what, level, then you get the sorry. rock damage to occur. Go ahead. Sorry, explain what you're doing here with this window. Well, here again, what we're doing is we, we have taken the uh, window and uh, we have uh, done a water test on it. And uh, there is a specific water test protocol that's been established by the American Society of Testing Materials, uh, where what you do is you mimic what would be wind-driven rain. And you do that water test to try and determine whether the water is coming in through the window or through the stucco or maybe both. And so we conduct that water test and you can see that we've, we've labeled it. Um, there's a little dam that's built in the corner there and we pour water into it. And that's one of the first tests that we'll do. And this is testing whether the window itself is leaking into the unit. Because if it cannot hold that water, if the window frame cannot hold the water, then that tells you that the window is, is inadequate in terms of providing water protection. And if the window is inadequate, then that water is going to leak. And you can see a little bit of the damage that's occurring at the very base of the window on the sill. And then that water continues to percolate down. And you can see underneath the damage that has occurred at the, uh, at the or to the plywood underneath. So here's uh, when when they perform the work inside, just to show an example. They, they do protect things. They're very efficient. They make sure they take everything apart and put it back the way it should be. Uh, that is an example of the lath. I'm going to skip through some of these. Uh, Here's when we opened up inside in between units. And this is something that gets forgotten about sometimes. Uh, why do you open up this wall here? This is, a, uh, this is a fire separation wall between the units. So this is intended to provide protection if there's a fire in one of the units so that the fire doesn't go across the wall into the next unit. And, and what we find is that that fire separation is not done as required by the code. And so what happens is you have uh, things like the separation, for example, of the electrical outlets that you see there. There's a certain distance that those outlets have to be kept apart. Uh, you have to look at the blocking so that uh, any, any fire that gets into the wall is stopped by the blocking. You have to take a look at the nailing of the wall to make sure that the size of the nails is sufficient to anchor that wall during a fire. You know, and again, nails are made out of steel. So when there's a fire, there's a tendency for that nail to, to soften by the heat become softened. If you don't have the right size nail, then it will not be able to protect you in a fire for a certain amount of, for a prescribed amount of time. And that fire will come into the next unit. Once again, water intrusion from, from, poor, um, from poor drainage on the site. In this case, what you saw there was just water coming into the unit at the bottom level because the water drainage was actually being directed towards the building as opposed to away from the building, which is what the code requires. So there's a code requirement, but it wasn't met in this, in this uh, location. And the water was literally coming into at the base of the wall. This is a post tensioning cable, which is used to reinforce the, uh, the slab. This is what provides your foundation for the building. And what we're seeing here is that that post tensioning cable, which is a high strength cable that's, that's pulled during construction, and then when the concrete is set, it's released so that it compresses the concrete together and it guarantees that you have a crack-free slab. Well, this one has busted. It was pulled, it was cinched, they let it go, and then it snapped. And so what you have is a broken cable here. So now you don't have an active foundation system like you should have. So now we're gonna talk about some high-rise buildings. Um, and again, whether they're condominiums or HOAs, it really doesn't matter. Construction is pretty much construction and they should be investigated if you, if you have uh, turnovers or if you have issues or even if you need to know really what the condition of the building is that was delivered to you. So here's a, here's a high rise that uh, we looked at and they did a walkthrough, but I'm gonna play a quick video of some of the, uh, the Marcon uh, when they go out to do their testing, and they look a little bigger here because I stretched this video out for the purposes of seeing it here, but... Uh, is it bare concrete? Is it a primer concrete? Okay. Let's start there. 
nice and easy one. Then we'll, from this one, we'll move to that uh, uh, above ground uh, planter and just take a look at the planter area. So they map out what they're going to do. Uh, what's happening here? So this is what we call a tap test, which is a simple test that's done when you have stucco over masonry. And what happens is, when, like I said, when you start getting that water intrusion, the stucco begins to delaminate away from the masonry. You tap and so you, you tap it, and, and you can hear the sound. You can hear how hollow that sound. And that's because they, the stucco has completely delaminated away from the masonry. That's not a good thing because over time that will just get worse. This is a high rise. Now imagine if you would, what would happen if you have stucco delaminating and falling off the building from a high rise? That is a life safety issue because anybody walking down below, they could be seriously hurt by that, by that stucco. So um, a few years back, the, uh, the courthouse in, in Sarasota had some, some issues with this where the stucco was literally falling off the building and, and damaging cars as they were driving by. And so it required a, an intervention and a, and a major repair if that stucco is not properly bonded to the building. And so these tests that are being conducted here that, that Sal is going through is like I said, first of all, we do that tap test to check the stucco. And then we literally cut into the stucco to show that it is, isn't bonded to the substrate, to the surface underneath. And, and you can see this man here is cutting through the stucco. And then as he as he finishes that cutting, he starts to do it slowly. See how easily it's coming off because it is absolutely not bonded to the to the uh, concrete and concrete masonry underneath. So that stucco is not bonded at all. And again, over time, it becomes more and more loose as more water gets behind it, and eventually it literally will start falling off the building. Same type of situation here. You, you have, you know, essentially the tap test was performed, and we found that the stucco was not was not at all anchored. Both. So in this in this high rise, we found that most of the stucco was not anchored to the building anymore. And so at, again, a relatively new building looks great, looks like it has no trouble at all, and within a few years, you would have the potential for that to literally be coming off the building and and causing damage underneath. Now this right here is a, is a window in that same high rise, uh, and you can see the water intrusion coming through the window. So here is a problem with the installation, not just of the window, but again, of the stucco around it and the flashing between the stucco and the window that allows this to happen. Now, once again, this is just proof that the construction was done in such a way that even for a relatively new building like this one, water was coming in. And as you multiply that water intrusion over a period of time, it just causes more and more damage to the point where those repairs become just prohibitively expensive. Um, this again is a demonstration showing us that, uh, how this stuff is being removed and how it is absolutely not bonded to the surface underneath like it's supposed to. And you can see it comes right off. There's absolutely no bonding anywhere on that stuff to the substrate so that it is supposed to be literally anchored chemically as well as mechanically to the surface underneath, and it is not at all. And that's because- uh, Felix, how, that's how, would, how would that bond be created? Well, that bond is created by, by again, by how you place the, uh, how you place the stucco. So the, the stucco, uh, as you place it, stucco is, is concrete, is essentially cement. And, and the masonry, concrete masonry is the same material. And so when the two come together, they will chemically bond when you apply the wet stucco on it, they chemically bond as well as mechanically because the surface of the masonry is rough. Where you have concrete, which has a smoother surface, you are required to use a bonding agent that chemically bonds that stucco to that surface. So the intent is to produce a, a finished product that's solid all the way through, not two separate components, but solid all the way through because what is, what's those like, two what's are separated. Like it yeah. creates a, a means for that water to travel between those two surfaces. And that's just something that you don't want to see. What, what likely did the contractor do wrong? Well, there's a number of things that they did wrong. One of the things that they did wrong was, again, uh, they, uh, they, they installed the stucco on a surface that was not clean, that, that had something on it. Uh, it can be dust 
you can have dust. So this, the surface is dirty. And so that, that stucco is not able to bond to it. It can be that there's no bonding agent on the concrete and the, the, the stucco as it comes onto a slick surface that's concrete will not bond to it. Uh, it can be that they misapplied a waterproofing material, something that's not approved. So that what happens is that waterproofing material creates a bond breaker between the stucco plaster installation and the material that it's supposed to attach to. If you have that bond breaker there, it means that that bond will never happen. So what you want is that chemical bond that puts those two together. And if you have something preventing that, then you now have two separate surfaces that when it gets wet, the water will travel between and cause additional separation of the stucco. Okay, let's out. Hang on, hang on. Once again, you know, we did the tap tests on these areas and we noticed that they sounded hollow. And as you see this man move this, this piece, uh, you can see once again, no bonding at all. Between, you see that? It's coming off in one piece. There's absolutely no bonding between that stucco and the surface underneath. And you can see the surface underneath is coated with a material. That's, that's an example of a material that the concrete block was coated with but unfortunately that coating prevented the stucco from bonding to it. It acted as a bond breaker. So rather than that protect the construction, it actually created a condition where the stucco is now a separate skin, kind of a loose skin on top of the masonry and it's not bonded at all like it should be. <clears throat> what do we have here, Sal? Here we have uh, some issues with the, the area beneath the pool. So, uh, we brought uh, Felix and Marcon Forensics out there to take a look. And, you know, you see a, a pool with the, and a hot tub that looks pretty okay. And then you go down below and you're finding that... Uh, this is hey, the... That, uh, that, that right at the skimmer, you saw Peter, now showing you photographs of the skimmer there. And what we saw is that the... The skimmer itself was fine, but the area around the perimeter of the skimmer was not properly waterproof. So the water is getting in around the edges of the skimmer. And, and what you see there is, is the, as the net result of that, now you have this leak that's coming underneath. And this is constantly wet because it's a pool. So this water is constantly coming through. Well, sometimes uh, there's some testing that needs to be done on windows. And I'll just go through some of this here. Uh, what are they doing here? So this is a, uh, this is a spray test. Uh, I mentioned this before. This is based on an ASTM standard, an American Society of Testing Materials. It's a protocol that they've set up where you actually set up a spray rack and, and you put in a negative pressure on that, on that window to simulate what wind-driven rain would be, which would be, we're not talking hurricane strength here. We're talking about just a regular rainstorm and then the wind just essentially beating that rain against the window. The windows are required by the code to be able to resist that. They're required to not be able to allow any wire to come in under this test. This is essentially the same test that this window would have gone to get certified in the state of Florida. You have to pass this test. And what you see is that as you start to spray the window and you apply this negative pressure, the water started to come in. And so that, that obviously tells you that, that this installation was not done properly, or not done in such a way to not allow that moisture to come through. Here's another type of building that, uh, that you looked at. Yeah, this is, this is a, a recent uh, construction, recent investigation that we did. Once again, uh, this is a masonry building, no wood framing here. Um, now we're looking at the roof and the roof has a combination of uh, of uh, a metal uh, roofing as well as uh, membrane roofing. And metal roofing looked great. And we asked them, you know, have you had any reports of, of roof leaks? And they said, yeah, we had a couple, you know, nothing, nothing really major. This is not a very uh, old project at all. It's a relatively new project. And, and then lo and behold, we looked at the roof and we said, oh no, we think we may have some problems. And as we did our testing, you can see that as we removed the roof uh, material or the roofing material, from the roof, we found, sure enough, that there is extensive damage underneath it. 
so there you can see right there uh, there's that's the intersection of the metal roof with the membrane roof and and you can see how much damage there is underneath it. that's all rotted out so once again you get these areas I'm good and if they're not treated properly you saw you saw him pulling that rotted roof yeah. underneath well that's their job uh, that's yeah. their <laughs> job and so this is a relatively new project that already has a high level of damage. Now this right here, again, same project. Uh, this is an installation. Again, this is a, uh, a spray test that we're conducting. And what you can see here is uh, as the spray test is taking place, we've placed this paper, this pink paper that turns out too when, when the water hits it. And you, can, you saw in that video how that water is just coming in. Not supposed to happen. Not supposed to and that was nothing that that was nothing that you could really see over the sill or the sheetrock, was it? No, there was no indication that this water. When we first started this test, there was absolutely no indication that this was a problem area. And yet, as soon as we conducted, well, as soon as we opened up the window, we saw that there was evidence that water had been coming in. But from the finished outside, you would not be able to tell that. But once we removed the finishes, we saw some evidence that water had come in, and then we conducted the test. And that definitely determined that the water was coming in. It told us how the water was coming in and, and to what extent that water was coming in. I want to say something about this particular project here. This is one where uh, we had some issues structurally, but uh, you know, when we had this case, I brought Felix in and all we did was a one day testing. We probably could have done a three day testing, but we did a one day testing and we did uh, the value of the case to address the defective conditions rose significantly, not because that we didn't know the defects were there, but because we had the appropriate expert uh, investigation and testimony that made the case more valuable. So that's why I always say it's important to have a, an engineer in the project. Um, here, explain what a I know you guys call them pot shelves, but explain that. Yeah, we're, we're, hitting, we're hitting the end, so let's pick, yeah, pick yeah. the best. This All is right, a, let me get through this to the pot shelf here. Yeah, I'll run through a real recess quick. window, and, and once again, here's a great photograph. Doesn't look bad, doesn't look bad at all. Uh, but we observed that it had a negative slope. We saw how it had been flashed. Uh, we, we opened it up, and then when we opened up, we had the oh my God moment. I mean, you can see, the lath is rusted. You can see the paper was improperly placed. That's a staple. You can see how rusted it is. And you can see the level of damage underneath it. So this location, which did not appear to be a problematic location to the untrained eye, but which we identified as a problematic installation, definitely when we opened it up, we found a, a serious amount of damage. As Sal mentioned, this is a one day destructive testing that we did. Typically we'll do a multi-day. Uh, but essentially from this one day that we did testing, we found that the damage to this community was extensive. And, and again, through Sal's work, they were able to recover funds and this community now is, is under repair. Um, but had we, you know, had Sal not become involved with this uh, and, and brought us on, uh, this community would have uh, essentially suffered some really serious, I mean, it's already serious, but some extremely serious damage to the community. Uh, we've seen projects like this that they reach a level of damage where the building department will red tag the project and require the, the tenants and homeowners to move out because um, they, you know, they're in danger. And when it gets to that point, then they have to essentially move everybody out. And as a homeowner, you're still making payments to the bank, but you can't live there because it's, it's compromised. Um, we never want to see that. We never want to see a project where it's going to get to the level where it's compromised like that, uh, or even in some extreme cases like the uh, Champlain Tower collapse, where it gets to the point where the building is so structurally compromised by water intrusion that, uh, that you get to the point where the uh, building department has to kick you out. <clears throat> well, we, we obviously could go on for, for quite a long time, uh, and, and we'll keep Felix on for a little bit. Because uh, I, I know there's people who have to go, but I'm going to uh, let Michelle Colburn close us out because she has this poll that, that she's doing. 
Well, one, um, one quick sec, one quick second, Alan. I do want to thank Felix because uh, it it was nice of him to take the time away today and and come and help us out and explain some of the things that have gone on. Um, really appreciate that. Uh, and uh, and if anybody has questions, I'll let you pick up from there, Alan. Sorry. Thanks, Al. Yeah, I, I, if, if anyone has any questions about it, anything we provided you today, you can email email us offline. Uh, it, it, if it's an engineering question, we can refer it over to Felix. He's happy to to give a, a, a quick re response to something that, that doesn't take an in-depth depth investigation. Uh, we are involved in all facets of turnover, turnover claims, uh, whether it's a site-related issue, a building issue, whether it's condo or HOA, uh, contact us and uh, we'll tell you whether it's appropriate for your building to have an evaluation. Uh, we make recommendations on who uh, should be doing that. We also get involved extensively in repair work, helping with the contracts, helping enforce the contracts. And unfortunately, when you didn't call us in the first place, we, we spent a lot of time cleaning up projects that didn't go well. Uh, so we, we are, we are, we are involved in that process too. And, and again, I repeat that the forensic methods that apply to new construction, uh, also apply to a, a mature building when you're trying to figure out how to repair it, uh, before you sign a contract to do repairs, you better look carefully at what you've got, uh, before you go forward. So, uh, I'm being told I have to answer the last question. Uh, it says we decided to have an engineering inspection on our 37 year old building, but are having problems getting proposals. Okay, so this is a reality. Uh, after Champlain Tower South, a, a group of very busy forensic engineers became much busier for obvious reasons. So uh, it, there is a delivery problem, a challenge these days because they're busy. Uh, we we uh, can connect you with them, use whatever leverage we have to get them out earlier, uh, but it, it, that is a challenge. Uh, there, you know, Champlain Tower South was a, was a blessing and a curse for the engineers in Florida because uh, people wanted the inspections done. And you know, if you're concerned about your building, you don't wanna wait 60, 90 days for that engineer to do their inspection, but there's only a, 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 a relatively small group of qualified engineers who can do these type of structural inspections. So uh, I, I, my sympathy is with the manager who are trying to get that done, but it, it, is, it is a challenge. Call us up, and we'll, we'll we'll try to twist some arms for you. What about the question on who pays for repairs, special assessment or insurance? All right. Well, who pays for repairs? If it's if it's a newer construction, uh, what we do is get the developer to pay for as much of those repairs as possible. If it's a mature property. You either do it by special assessing the owners. Uh, if if you, you may have an insurance claim, if it's if it's covered under a policy that covers part of it. Uh, we have a, a lot of excellent banks who are very happy to loan money to uh, to associations if you have a, uh, a a fairly small default rate on your assessment collection. And a lot of groups, rather than hit their owners with a major special assessment. Uh, we'll get a, a, a credit line to cover uh, an extraordinary expense or at least part of it. So uh, from our, uh, from our standpoint, if we are involved, if, from our standpoint, if we are involved and it's something that uh, we think there's potentially liable parties out there, uh, we analyze your case. And if we feel that we can gain a positive result, then that would be that much less if anything, that the association would have to pay for repairs. And sometimes, especially with newer uh, projects, you may have some significant repairs of, 
or significant damage issues of what was supposed to be given. But when it's all said and done, you do have the ability to look at what needs to be done versus what should be done as far as what should be given to you so that you can pace things out so that you can use the money that's recovered to do what is needed to be done and you limit your out-of-pocket expense. Yeah, I mean, if I was to summarize what we do, we, we get developers, contractors, architects, and engineers uh, to pay as large a portion of the owner's obligation to repair as, we, as, as, as we're able to in any particular case. If you, if, you, if you don't pursue responsible parties, it's guaranteed that the owners will pay 100% of the repair cost. If you do pursue responsible parties, you have an opportunity uh, to, for the owners uh, to, to share only a portion of the cost and, and with the developer and liable parties uh, picking up the rest. So that's, that's basically the guts of what a, a defect claim is all about helping get some money from other parties to take care of the association's problem. Uh, that's what we do. That's what Felix does. Again, we thank everybody for attending. Uh, the, this will be available on our website within a week, I am told. And uh, we have a really interesting session next month on the connected townhomes and the need to amend the documents so that there's coherent repair and maintenance and claim ability. Um, so that uh, for those who live in that type of community, uh, that should be very interesting. That one is a CEU for managers. So uh, everybody have a great day.